When it comes to MMA, you could say Khabib is the GOAT, John Jones is the GOAT, Conor McGregor, Demetrius Johnson, Anderson Silva, Amanda Nunes, Fedor Emelianenko. You could say all these names, but you'd be wrong. Hard rush, shake, be one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. George Shapiro is the greatest mixed martial arts of all time. This guy was my father's favorite fighter. I grew up watching his fights. The rise of George St. Pierre from a bullied karate kid to the unquestionable MMA GOAT is nothing short of spectacular. So I will be world champion. Thank you very much. He beat everyone he ever uh, faced. George is one of a handful of people who started approaching the sport in a truly professional fashion. When I do something in life, I, I go 110%. I win, I win big, I lose, I lose big. I, I've been a, an underdog all, all my life, but uh, you know, I work hard to be where I'm at. But he's had no shortage of criticisms. You're not finishing fights, you never went up a weight class. People say that you're kind of boring. He's not as good as people um, think. And you're too tactical. You're not providing the drama that a fight should. And had an abundance of controversies. I'm not saying GSP Grease, I'm just saying he was slick. Grease gate and everything else that has been called. They poisoned my IV with some kind of weird ass drug. I'm blown away that George St. Pierre won that fight. This is the entire career and legacy of George St. Pierre. Everything I've done in my life was to get me closer to my ultimate goal. I want to be known as the best fighter in the world. I wanted to become UFC world champion. I wanted to become the best fighter. That was my dream. If people think my goal was to be champion, it's, it's, it's BS. It's not my goal. And I'm just here to answer one question. A lot of people, including myself, consider you the greatest of all time. Do you agree? How can a guy who loses like this call himself the GOAT? That's GSP getting knocked out by a fighter with a 9-4 and four record. And not only that, he tapped to strikes. That's not the kind of thing you'd expect from someone in the running for the greatest of all time. That knocked out is the most humiliating day of my career. But I want to lay it all out on the table that there is a lot of failure in this story. I've lost many, 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 many times. I've lost before I learn how, how to win. And at a surface level, you might dismiss him for his failures, comparing him to names like John Jones and Khabib. I've always believed the three greatest mixed martial artists I've ever seen in my life were George St. Pierre, Khabib Nurmagomedov, and John Jones. But if you want to understand how that loss makes him the GOAT, we have to go back like way back. Oops, not that far. Look, you gotta feel bad for this guy. He's wrestling a young George St. Pierre. He had no chance, even as young as George is here. And as impressive as GSP's wrestling was by the time he was 19, it wasn't his first martial art. As before I, I started wrestling, I was karate guy, pure. And I, I just acclimate myself very well to wrestling. People yeah. are like, no way, karate, no. And I, yes, karate that allowed me to cut the distance and take, take the people down. I start when I was very young and it saved my life, you know, because I, I started when I was bullied uh, in, in school. Unlike George's contemporaries who started martial arts for sport or for money, GSP needed karate to stop bullies from stealing his clothes and lunch money. That's one of the reasons why I started martial art, because of a self-defense and I got, I was bullied when I was young. And at the time, I saw it as a very negative experience, and it was. But I realize now, like the fact that I was bullied when I was young helped me later on in my life facing the mental warfare that I had to face in mixed martial arts because it's a very egotistic sport. I remember when I was a kid, I was looking at myself in the mirror and I didn't like myself. I didn't like what I, what I saw in myself because I wanted to change my environment. And martial art taught me that if you want to change your environment, you want to change yourself, you need to love yourself first. Despite becoming a second Dan Black Belt by age 12, loving himself wasn't going to be easy because to everyone around him, GSP was just dreaming too big. I was a very, very young kid. I was like maybe 12 years old. Like the teacher was asking everybody in the class, what do you want to do for when you get older? And uh, some were like, oh, I want to be an engineer, a doctor or whatever. And, and when they came to me, I really didn't know what, what I wanted to do. 
And I said I wanted to be a WWE uh, wrestler because <laughs> I was a, a fan of Hulk Hogan because MMA did not exist at the time yeah. when I was a uh, that young and everybody start laughing like they were all laughing i'm from a little country place five thousand people live there you know uh, people used to tell me all my life oh you will never be a, a fighter you know you you're not tough enough you're not strong enough when i saw the first ufc when royce gracie won the first ufc that's when i knew like i was like that's what i want to do you know like that's I see myself in this. Yeah. GSP made his pro MMA debut at 20 years old. I fought in TKO and it used to be UCC. Yeah. I, I watched your first fights, man. I watched you in the TKO organization. I had like five or six fights in, in UCC. Where I'm from, my country, it, it was illegal in Canada, you know. I remember every fight, I didn't make much money. My first fight, I made a uh, thousand $300 because my opponent did not make weight, so I gained 30% of his purse! Oh my God. It was my bad. I missed two pounds weight. And Josh pushed me, I fall on my butt, he get in my guard, and he start punching, punching. George finished Ivan Manjivar in the first round, which earned him a title shot for what would become the TKO Canadian Worldweight Championship. After me, he win the belt of UCC against uh, Justin Brockman. Ran into a fella named, uh, his name is George. <laughs> I remember George hit me with a takedown on that, and I actually, he sat me on my ass, and I actually remember like saying out loud in the ring, I'm like, shit. There's nine, nine million views on YouTube. I am using my head as a f basketball. He finished this fight even sooner, and this time with a submission instead of strikes. Because everyone's like, oh, you'll get him next time. Like, no, nah, man. That guy, I fight that guy a hundred times. He's going to beat me up 100 times. This young welterweight champion was quickly developing a well-rounded skill set. Hey, I'm George Champier, the Canadian welterweight champion. At the time when I started mixed martial arts, it was not something that you could do and make a, a living. But I always have faith that at one point the sport could grow to a, a certain level that you can you can make it. GSP rounded out 2002 with another first round finish and his first taste at a title defense. Just in case it isn't clear, GSP was a dominant and defending champion in his first year as a pro fighter. Many other GOAT candidates didn't win a non-tournament MMA title prior to the UFC, and those that did never defended those titles. I'm Georges St. Pierre, the UCC Canadian welterweight champion. Tonight, that's my first international bout. In 2003, GSP had two more fights as champion. He brutally finished Thomas Denny in the second round, and at the end of the year, he had his toughest test. There was a guy, his name was Pete Spratt. Everybody knows he's one of the best uh, strikers in the welterweight division. Pete Spratt beat Robbie Lawler, who, who became later champion of the UFC. And my manager at the time brought Pete Spratt to fight me in TKO. And Pete Spratt didn't know who I was. I wasn't nobody at the time. And, and he probably thought that he was coming to collect an easy paycheck. And I beat Peace Pratt. I uh, beat him with a rear naked choke. And uh, that was my, my ticket for the UFC. Not only was that an impressive choke over a veteran, but it also had an uncanny resemblance to a recent finish by his soon to be rival. I did my ape technique like uh, Matthews against uh, Frank Triggs. I call that my ape technique. <laughs> Pete Spratt was scheduled to fight uh, Carl Parisian in the upcoming UFC. Is that a fight that you want? Would you be happy to go into the UFC and take on Carl Parisian in his place? My dream is to go fight in UFC, you know. GSP finished every man across from him before entering the UFC. And although you might say these weren't tough competitors, Pete Spratt is no slouch, and GSP didn't have many options. Up in Canada, it was just like that TKO organization, right? And yeah, a couple it was, more. Yeah, it was pretty much only t the TKO. One. But more than that, finishing your opponents on the regional scene is kind of what you expect from a future GOAT. However, out of the greats, only GSP and John Jones can say that they finished every man they faced prior to the UFC. Ugh, God damn it, I was gonna show you GSP's first interview as a UFC fighter next, but that video's not available in my region. But don't worry, I've got NordVPN. I'm sure you've heard the internet is a very dangerous place. I mean, you could be searching for something very personal and everyone can see what you're doing. Hey, I got a text from GSP. 
Oh my god. I search for a lot of things to make these videos, but NordVPN keeps me safe across the internet with a single click. Because they don't track what I do online and protect my traffic with robust encryption. Remember, Herb Dean says to protect yourself at all times, but follow my instructions and go to nordvpn.com slash Lionel in the description to get a two-year plan plus four months free. And with a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose by trying NordVPN. That's a fantastic deal, but calling NordVPN just a VPN is like calling GSP just some French Canadian who likes to beat up other men half naked. They're both more than just that. NordVPN's threat protection shields you from malware, trackers, and ads. The data breach scanner notifies you if your sensitive information has been exposed. And my favorite feature is that it allows me to access content that may not be available in my region with a single click. Get all these benefits and more with my exclusive link in the description at nordvpn.com slash Lionel. That's nordvpn.com slash Lionel for a two-year plan plus four months free. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video and allowing us to see GSP's first interview as a UFC fighter. Bonjour, je m'appelle Georges Saint-Pierre. Je viens de Montréal, au Canada. J'ai 22 ans et puis ça, et puis je vais faire mes débuts au UFC. Exactement en deux jours et je suis très excité. J'espère donner un bon spectacle à mes fans. Ce que, ce que je vais faire normalement, mon plan c'est d'être par-dessus au sol ou soit de, de garder le combat debout. What a great debut! Congratulations, George St. Pierre! Kyra Parisian was a tough UFC debut. It was GSP's first pro decision, and he narrowly escaped two close submissions, but otherwise dominated a great fighter. However, his next fight played out much differently. A lot of great fighters uh, on this card tonight. Guys who uh, fell out and stepped up, Jay Haran, who came in to fight George St. Pierre. Not many people know Jay Haran, but I've seen him train. He is a phenomenal fighter. Some people can can think it's it was a lucky shot tonight. I have to say I train very hard. You know I, I deserve what I what I what I, uh, what I do. George Rush Saint Pierre. George Saint Pierre is phenomenal. What an amazing fighter he is. He is very athletic, very explosive, and and talk about a well-rounded MMA fighter. He is definitely the new breed of, of UFC fighters. I just want to keep fighting in the UFC, go step by step, and one day I want to go, I want to have a, a shot for the title. I just want to let go my fans. I want to keep, I want to stay in the UFC, I want to be a UFC guy, and soon I will be world champion. Thank you very much. GSP was very driven to become champion, but he was also very self-aware of his abilities. You know, I just turned 23. I know I'm not the best welterweight in the world right now. I know it. I need to improve more if I want to have a shot for the title. GSP knew he wasn't the best, which wasn't the problem. The problem was that he over-idolized the best fighter. De tous les temps, livre pour livre, la meilleure. D'après moi, je devrais aller avec Matthews. Matthews, you know, Matthews is a monument in the sport. Matthews was the unstoppable welterweight champion, so it's understandable that George would be in awe, but when you're only three UFC fights deep and you have to face your idol, your mind becomes an obstacle. I was fighting my my idol at the time. It was my third fight in the UFC and I was fighting this legend, Matt Hughes. Man, I was fighting this monument, this oh my god. I was like, I didn't sleep for the week, man. I, even in the stare down, I couldn't even look at him. I look up like this. Pressure was, it's, it was the, the first fight I had the pressure like this. I didn't see myself beating him. He was getting up off the ground from underneath you. And when I clinched him the first time, I was like, eh, wow, this is the, the most strongest guy in the sport. I can overpower with him. He took Hughes down once. He is the, the, the new breed of mixed martial artists. I performed very well, but just at the end of the round, maybe the five last second of the round, I, I did a beginner mistake. I never did that type of mistake. I fight as a spectator during the last second of the round. It's all nice. over! Matt Hughes with a submission victory! I did a good fight, but he, he cut me with an armbar. Yeah. And it's after the fight when I watched the fight, I sat down and I watched the fight, I realized I was like, man, I could have beat him. I think if the fight would continue, I think I would uh, win because my I was not tired at all and he didn't hurt me and I felt I, I was not impressed by his strength. I knew I was going to lose. The confidence was not there. I have the skill, but it's not the confidence. And it taught me something. 
I should never put nobody on a pedestal. Everybody's a human being. We're all the same. So what's next for you after this? Who's in the waiting in the wings for you? Who's next for George St. Pierre? George St. Pierre, in my opinion, still now, even after the fight, is one of the most talented fighters in this sport. I don't know who's next now. I fought the best welterweight fighter in the sport, and I think uh, this will be a positive experience. The kid has such a great attitude. I couldn't say enough good things about him. GSP was just 23 years old when he was thrown at a legendary champion in just his third UFC fight. Comparatively, great fighters like John Jones, Khabib Nurmagomedov, and Alexander Volkanovsky didn't fight for a belt until at least their eighth UFC bout. GSP was just far too green, and had he taken a safer road to the belt with more tune-up fights, he may have never suffered this loss. But it didn't matter. He had the right mindset. He just had to find another path back to Matt Hughes. I'm very proud to come back in Montreal, fight in front of my fans. Just three months after that loss, GSP defended his TKO Canadian Welterweight Championship for the last time. A first round Kimura finish just reinforced that GSP was better than pretty much everybody, and soon after, he signed an exclusive contract with the UFC. I said it before when he fought, and I'll say it again. George St. Pierre is the new breed of mixed martial artists. I fought Jason Miller. I'm on top of him, and Jason Miller is on the bottom. We're near the fence. I think we're in half guard, and I throw elbow, big, big elbows. This corner man, they're screaming at me. F you, Frenchie, go back in your country, Frenchie. And then I look at him, F you, and then I boom, boom. George St. Pierre, congratulations. Now, you just told me you were sick coming into this fight. You can't even breathe out of your nose. Is that true? I don't want to give a, an excuse. Well, you can't excuse. You just dominated. There's no excuse. Fighting is uh, my life. That's what I, I love to do in my life. And I, I hope I'm going to do it for a long time. That was a dominant win, but it was expected. Jason wasn't the caliber of fighter that George was. But George's next opponent would be Frank Trigg, a terrifying opponent who challenged for the UFC title twice already and almost submitted Matt Hughes. The question is, was George's mind strong enough to face another legend? You know, do you get scared going into a fight? Of course I'm scared. I'm not scared of my opponent. Uh, I'm scared to not perform like I'm like I'm supposed to. I was afraid every fight, but it does not matter. Because as much as I'm afraid, you know, I'm by no mean a perfect man, by no mean, but one thing that I'm not, I'm not a coward. No matter who I'm fighting, I'm gonna go out there and I don't care about how I feel because it's subjectivity. I only care about the objective. What I need to do in order to take you out of your comfort zone. He's dominating Frank Trigg. This is surprising. Me, myself, how I feel, if I'm sick or not, what the other people think, that does not exist. The only thing that exists and matter is the objectivity, the things that you need to do to succeed. George St. Pierre has choked out Frank Trigg. These need to be done at all costs. Yeah, George St. Pierre, that was the, the, the most dominating performance we've seen from you in the Octagon against one of your toughest opponents. I mean, are you just getting this much better? The short answer was yes, he was getting that much better. But according to George's very first opponent, he didn't fully make the turn into the man we know today until his next fight. Well, George came the George we know today after Sean Shirk. I believe Sean Shirk has a broken nose. His, his nose is a bloody mess. Sean Shirk could not withstand an assault of elbows and fists by George St. Pierre, who is the winner in this welterweight bout. GSP completely destroyed a legend, a man who would eventually become the second UFC lightweight champion. So you know what was on GSP's mind. Am I gonna go on my knees like that and ask the UFC management to give me a world title shot? Please, I want the belt so bad, give it to me. He didn't get a title shot as a result of that plea. He had to fight BJ Penn. Toughest fight that I had was my first fight with BJ Penn. The most skilled martial artist that I ever fight. He was like the, com the perfect fighter. For the uninitiated, BJ Penn is one of the greatest fighters Ever. He was a former welterweight champion and future lightweight champion. He catched me with, a, I think, a jab right in the eyes. I saw him in double. I tried to run away, you know, the first round because I tried just to survive. I couldn't fight with him. I saw two big Japan in front of me. He was good everywhere. He, he had very little weaknesses. If you talk to me before every fight, I can 30 seconds give you my whole strategy. My first fight with BJ Japan was 
or I'm gonna keep it standing up, keep the fight from the outside, you know, because I'm faster than him. I found out that I was not faster than him. His reaction time was better than, 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 than mine. So I got beat up the first round. Like I had a bloody nose and everything. His nose is jacked, probably broken. I had a terrible first round, so I had to switch gear. My plan B was now I'm gonna wrestle, make, make him tired and trying to put him down. And that's how I beat him, because I switched gear. George Rush St. Pierre! The win over BJ was a massive deal, even if it was a split decision. It proved that GSP could beat champions, so now it was time for GSP to get up close and personal with his idol. I'm very glad you won that fight, Matt but uh, I'm not impressed by your performance and I look forward to, to fight you in the near future. That was probably the most polite call out ever. But before we get to the rematch, we have to talk about The Ultimate Fighter. The fourth season of The Ultimate Fighter gave unsuccessful UFC welterweights the chance at a title shot. What made it interesting is that GSP was one of the coaches and everyone knew that GSP was going to fight for the belt before the winner of the reality show competition. So the people George was training knew that they were either going to fight Matt Hughes or possibly GSP at the end of their season. And you can imagine how awkward it was when Matt Hughes showed up during the show. I don't want to be friend with him. I don't want to share any technique with him. And despite avoiding him, Matt Hughes was insistently annoying to GSP at a sushi dinner, bringing up armbar defense and just asserting dominance. But in the background, the season's prime underdog Matt Sarah won all his matches to win the Ultimate Fighter and guarantee a future welterweight title shot. The only two questions now were, would Matt Sarah fight GSP or Matt Hughes? And would GSP finally overcome the pressure of fighting his idol? A very therapeutic thing I, that I like to do is drive my car around and see normal people. I drive and I see an old lady with her grocery store bag. This straight long punches by George. And I'm thinking, like, she doesn't care if I win the fight Saturday <laughs> or not. She's not even gonna hear about it. I kick and versatile with a striking. And I look, right, oh, he's right. another guy yelling to another guy. Good leg kick, a smile on Hughes' face. Oh, this guy is going to the bank to pay his mortgage. That one did some damage. They don't care. They don't care, you know. What a job done by George St. Pierre. The effect that I have on the universe is so freaking small. Oh, oh they kick. They close him. Oh, he's Nobody cares. I'm the only one putting the pressure on me. Nobody yeah. gives a damn about it. So that's why they helped me to perform now. I had a very hard way up here. And wow, it's, it's just amazing. I, you know, I'm so surprised. I'm so happy. I, I can't even, like, cry. You know, I, it's, I, can't, I can't describe how, how my feeling right now. It's too, too much. He did it. He beat his idol. And he beat him in dominant fashion to become champion. It's enough to make a grown man cry. But trust me you're gonna wanna save those tears. I was fighting a, a, a veteran, Matt Serra at the time, who really, nobody really gave a chance to beat me because it, all the odds was against him, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember it was the odds in Vegas were crazy. Remember Matt Serra, the guy who won the Ultimate Fighter and was guaranteed a title shot? Well, now a very confident George St. Pierre had to fight a man who probably had no business being in there with him. So when I became champion, I beat Matt Hughes. I was on a, on a high. Now, now it was the opposite. I had too much, too much confidence. I, I, and, and I had a lot of people telling me, oh, you're the, I was a new kid on the block. You know, like I was very young. I was like, uh, I just beat the legend Matt Hughes. And people, everybody was telling me how good I am. And I start to believe it, <laughs> unfortunately. I respected Matt Sarah, but I felt like I was not scared enough. I get into the fight, I was kind of stiff. How often did you doubt yourself when you were competing? Every fight. Matt Serra is the only fight that I slept well. I always laugh when people say, you know, oh, George was afraid, so he was mentally weak. That's a very, very shallow understanding of mental strength and weakness. I trained well and everything. I just like my, I felt, I felt like I was stiff and my hand didn't, I didn't let my body go. You know, it's, it was weird. I, I don't know. When I got hit by Matsura the first punch, I got punched by, by a looping punch that I never saw coming and I got dizzy. And we heard him again. We heard him again. Standards were very, very high. 
That's what he was afraid of. He wasn't afraid of his opponent. I got wobble and I got so angry. I was like, because back in the day it was like five to one, ten to one the the odds. I was like, I can't believe I got wobble by a guy like this. Yeah. So when I hurt George, he Longo pointed to that. He goes, when you hurt, manage your distance. Keep your distance, manage and line it up. And that's what we did. First time I ever happened in my life. So I wanted to give it back to him as fast as I can. But Masare hit very hard. I made the mistake to trying to get back into the fight right away. Then I tried to jump back into a war with him, into a, a slugfest with him while I was wobble. So I got punched like boom, 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 boom. Bang, bang, bang. I end up on my back and now I'm Can't confronted see like, to my worst nightmare. Oh man. So am I gonna go out on my shell like this <laughs> or I'm tapping out like a coward? I knew that it was finished for me because I didn't know where I was. So I turn on the side and I tap on strike. MMA it's a big, big thing. And I got blamed a lot because they say, oh, he's a quitter, he tap out. Oh, he tap on, on strike. He's a quitter. So people now start doubting me, saying, oh, uh, he's not as good as people um, think. And he's a quitter. He's a quitter. That was the big thing. I have no excuse. I was in great shape. My training was very good. And congratulations to Matsaro. I'm here with a very disappointed George St. Pierre after losing your belt, your first uh, title defense. Was that like, that had to be like the most devastating loss of your career, right? It was, but I learned something valuable. Mm, I don't know. I mean, I just lost the title. I, I lost. Period. Uh, I'm not used to that. I hate to lose. Fight with Matt Serra taught me that I should never, never, never underestimate nobody. No matter how good you are, how good people tell you you are, you are you're always at one mistake to lose everything. I have no excuse, by the way. I lost, I lost. Uh, period, you know. Thank you, and I want to thank, say thanks to my fans. Uh, uh, we'll st stick with me and uh, I'll be back stronger. GSP's title reign died almost as quickly as it began, murdered by his own ego and perhaps the greatest upset in UFC history. Most people would not be able to recover from such a humiliating failure, but George St. Pierre is not most people and there's still a lot more story for you to see. And by the way, everybody out there, don't watch the rematch. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Matt Sarah, we're gonna get to that rematch, but to truly appreciate GSP's determination to win, you have to understand the people he surrounded himself with. By this point in his career, GSP had pretty much assembled the Avengers of cornermen and trainers. He had kickboxing champion Phil Nurse for his striking, but even more notably, he had four other legendary coaches. You put together a great camp now though, man. You got, you're going to so many different great guys. John Donaher, who's uh, one of the most uh, underrated or underappreciated jiu-jitsu coaches in MMA, in the world really. That guy's a bad motherfucker. John Danaher is highly regarded as one of, if not the greatest mind in submission grappling. And George would stop at nothing to train with this man. George, when I first met him, I was a garbage, a garbage man. He would jump on a, a bus from Montreal to New York. Now that's a, that's a long bus ride. He would come down on the Friday afternoon when he finished work as a garbage man, stay for the weekend, and then late on Sunday night, he would jump on a bus all the way back to Montreal and work as a garbage man. That's an extraordinary commitment for a young man. I've always said George is the only athlete that I ever coached who taught me more than I taught him. Not only does he have Danaher to improve his jiu-jitsu, but he has Greg Jackson in his corner, the man who led Holly Holm, Rashad Evans, and of course, John Jones to UFC world titles. But George's team accolades don't stop there. Every day I find time, I go to Freddie Roach to work on my boxing. George trained under Freddie Roach, the man who trained Manny Pacquiao, James Tony, and other boxers, becoming one of the best boxing trainers ever. And last but certainly not least, we have Faraz Zahabi. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever talked to. Faraz is a f genius, le legitimate genius, knows everything about MMA. Faraz Zahabi is one of the greatest minds in mixed martial arts and was GSP's main MMA coach for the majority of his career. And some might call his methods a little mad. When Faraz, some of the guys, Faraz went to tell them, like he whispered to them, hey, if you knocked out George and Sparring, I'll give you money or, you know, things really? like that. Yeah, man, it's like, he's crazy. <laughs> Faraz is crazy. Faraz is my worst enemy in training sometimes, you know? <laughs> you know, George was like, uh, you know, he was on your show and he was saying, I'll try to kill him in the practice room. <laughs> Now, I, it's true, he's right. I'd give a speech. 
The first guy to double leg him, the first guy to put him out, a five thousand dollar reward. Uh, I to think knock him out? To hurt? If you knock George out, I'll give you 5,000 bucks. And as crazy as that sounds, you can't deny the results. And GSP genuinely believed that these were the right guys to have beside him. So Ferraz and John, for me, are the most competent people that I can have to help me going to fight someone because they're not really only trainers, they're teachers. And I would say the same thing about Freddie Roach. A group of trainers like this was not only essential for GSP skill building, but he needed them to mentally prepare to dominate this division. So my family before the fight, I stay away from them. I stay away from a lot of the people that I love, that are my circle of friends. I bring back closer to people like, like Ferraz, John, the, the, the fighters, guys. When you go into war, you don't bring a... Uh, yeah, your wife, your kid, your, your family, and uh, you, you bring the people that you go in war with. This mentally impregnable GSP was now on a war path to his belt. And unfortunately for Josh Koscheck, he just happened to be in the way. I think I'm better at him in every single aspect of the game. I'm very prepared for this fight. I think people under underestimate some of my skill. How prepared he is, I don't know. He really brought it to Koscheck in a way that Koscheck wasn't expecting it, and that threw him out of his game. I'm not thinking about what he's gonna do to me, I'm thinking about what I'm gonna do to him. He out-wrestled the wrestler. Josh Koscheck, being a phenomenal wrestler, just got completely thrown out of his game and found himself on his back for the majority of the mat with George St. Pierre just delivering a beating. I want to apologize to my fans for my last uh, fight. I think it's the best thing ever, the best thing ever happened to me for my career. And now I have a brand new version. I'm better than ever. So with this win over Koscheck, um, you've been pretty much guaranteed a welterweight uh, title shot. Um, it's got to mean a lot to you to get a chance to get your belt back. Absolutely. Um, I learned a lot from my mistake last time. And I'm the kind of guy who may not, never make the same mistake twice. As someone who watched all of GSP's fights to make this video, the Koscheck fight felt like his turning point, which couldn't have come at a better time because Matt Hughes was challenging Matt Serra for the welterweight title just a few months later. However, Matt Serra got injured, so George St. Pierre sees the perfect opportunity to not only compete for the interim world to a title, but to also settle his trilogy with his idol. I'm fighting for the title now. I'm very glad. Uh, I want to get back to what I've lost. Well, I'm very excited for Saturday night interim championship five round against Matt Hughes. I made a mistake last time. Uh, I learned a lot from it. This that loss was probably the best thing ever happened to me. I came back stronger than ever, and now I'm. I want to bring back the title in Canada. One thing about fighting George is I know he's ready, and I know it's going to be a war. I cannot promise my fan that I will win. What I can promise to my fan is that they will see the, the best George Champier, the most well-prepared George Champier I can be. Here he goes, Champier, are you up next? Are you ready? I'm like, yes. One minute, sir. Go in the bathroom by myself. I go, I go look myself in the mirror, and that's what I do before the fight. I'm telling myself all the reasons why I think I will win the fight. I try to convince myself like a kid, you know, like, I'm the greatest, I'm the strongest. As long as I believe it, it will transform the way mm. I see myself and will make me more confident. I'm beautiful, I'm strong, I'm this. I train harder than him, I put more time than he did. Faster, I'm stronger, I'm gonna win. I have better trainers, I have better training partners. I flew in all these killers in training camp to try to test me and I got through like a champion. These young guys, they lose, but I'm gonna show them what they, the way to do it. When I got out of the bathroom, I'm not the same person that I was when I when I got in. It's showtime. So that's why I'm going to take off this belt. Because for me, yes, it's a good collection, but doesn't mean nothing to me. Thanks to the UFC to give me that. It's a good uh, good honor. But the real champion is Matt Serra. And until I, I don't get my belt back, I'm not going to consider myself champion. Imagine having such a fierce mindset that you can demolish the man who gave you your first loss for a second time, earn another belt, and only focus on the other loss you haven't avenged. Look, I've never lost a world title in front of millions of people, and you probably haven't either. But we can all resonate with not only the fear of humiliation, but the draining weight of when you are humiliated. I was terrified before every fight, and you know there's a lot of people watching you. I was not so much afraid of getting hurt, even though I knew it was a possibility. I was afraid to be humiliated. My ego. I saw a sport psychologist, and he says to me, he says, 
you're not focusing on the right thing. Mm. You're, you're focusing always on what happened in the past. You live in the past. You need to live in the present moment. And I don't like that feeling. It, 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 get, it makes you very uncomfortable. It's very, very stressful. So he made me carry a brick and he made me wrote a name, Sarah, Matt Sarah on it. I was carrying a lot of bricks and this brick, the name of that brick was Matt Sarah. And I carry that brick every day, every training carrying a lot of bricks on myself. But when you carry a brick only one day, it's not heavy. But if you carry the same brick like every single day in a year, it's become heavier. And after a while, like, man, my bag is heavy, heavy for nothing. It suck, you know? I realized through time that every fight is bigger than the last one. So you're more afraid. Every fight is, is bigger and you're, you have more to lose. And I carry it, carry it until the time I got tired of carrying it. I'm like, you know what? I should not be afraid to say that I'm afraid. There is no courage without fear. I took the brick, I went near the Saint Laurent River. I know it sounds crazy. And I threw it in the river. And I feel deliver. More knees by GSP. George St. Pierre is the undisputed UFC welterweight champion. I want to say thanks to Matt Serra. He came here, he took the fight in my town in Quebec, in Canada, in Montreal. Man, it mean a lot to me. You uh, redeem yourself and defeat Matt Serra. Was that the greatest moment of your career thus far? Yeah, the greatest moment, moment of, of my life so far. Uh, it was amazing, a dream, dream come true. George St. Pierre relieved himself of unfathomable humiliation by detaching his ego and fighting like the champion he was always destined to become. However, this would hardly be his greatest adversity overcome inside or outside of the cage. And as much as it meant to avenge his second loss, it seemed that GSP was even more determined to prove to himself that he could finally earn that first title defense. I have the opportunity to succeed where I fell last time in my first title defense, and I want, don't want to do the same mistake as last time. And still, the undisputed USC World Welterweight Champion. GSP walked through John Fitch, a man on a 16 fight win streak, and that meant quite a lot. But as you'll recall, GSP doesn't like blemishes on his record, and there was a certain legend he did beat, but it was via split decision. I'm ready to fight everybody, everybody who deserves a shot. And I know BJ Penn won it. Oh, put the fight together. Let's do this. At this point in time, BJ was the former welterweight champion and current lightweight champion. But BJ wanted to challenge GSP to become the first simultaneous two division champion in UFC history. If you lose, you lose a belt. If he loses, he still got a belt uh, at the 155 division. If he wins tomorrow night, will truly make him probably the best pound for pound fighter in mixed martial arts. So pound for pound was on the line and so was redemption for the first fight. After that first fight, it was controversial. How much of this is a revenge fight that you say, you know what, I gotta, I gotta prove the fact that, you know what, I won that first fight, I want some revenge. I've been saying that the whole time you're lucky if in your lifetime you get to see three or four of these types of fights. He put on some extra motivation when he said some bad things about me and about the people that I that I like. A lot of things that he have said, it, it, it's not nice about me. Huh? BJ says, we're going to fight to the death. I'm really going to be trying to kill you on Saturday night. And for some reason, I believe him. I really admire BJ. I got a lot of respect for him. Uh, but uh, I want to be known as the best fighter in the world. And to be the best, the, the guy to beat is BJ Penn. Two guys in their prime, um, both hungry, both champions. Uh, and both going into a fight wanting to finish each other. Like Dana said, they, this is one of those fights we're gonna make history. At the time, every MMA fan couldn't help but wonder, what was GSP going to do differently to put a stamp on this feud? Let's say we're equal. We're the same person. What's gonna make the difference between me winning against you or you winning against me is the tactical. I will know how, where I can take you out of your comfort zone and I can bring the fight where I'm the strongest. I program like a computer. How I want to react against that specific problem. I bring a lot of speed, I bring good reflexes. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna give everything, fight with my heart. When I fought BJ Penn, I knew that BJ Penn had the best reaction time of all fighters we have seen in UFC. I knew that BJ Penn has a very fast reaction time, but had a very poor reset time. BJ Penn was so fast, but he's like more like a sprinter. So what I did the second fight, I, when I fought BJ Penn, I made him flinch. I knew I broke him uh, mentally after the first round. 
So all that, that reaction time that he used to flinch was not used properly to avoid my punches. Were you surprised that he lasted as long as he did because you were putting a pretty bad whipping on him throughout? Uh, not at all, he's, he's a very tough guy. So he got overwhelmed and he got tired very, very fast. So that's how I beat him. It's all over! Wow! Herb has stopped the fight! I was not fighting for this, for the belt. I already got it, you know? I was fighting for the name. I was fighting BJ Penn. You know, last time I fought him, I won in the decision. This time I really wanted to take him out. And I'm glad that I did it. Even though a lot of, of things has been said, I, I have a lot of respect for him. Whatever respect GSP had for BJ would dissipate rapidly because the aftermath of this fight drew a ton of controversy. He did have some controversy in the BJ Penn fight, yep. a fight which he dominated. The situation with BJ Penn and GSP with the uh, the Vaseline incident in, in GSP's corner. Grease gate and everything else that has been called, George. I'm not saying GSP greased. I'm just saying he was slick. GSP's corner appeared to rub Vaseline on his back in between rounds, which BJ argued was an intentional tactic to give GSP an advantage in the grappling exchanges. I, I, I didn't know what happened because I wasn't in the fight, so when you're in a fight, you don't realize what happened. You've heard some of the blogs. Why did George have to result to using extra Vaseline? He was dominating the fight. He was going to win the fight anyway. Either the trainer was, was a very good trainer with a lot of experience and, and leaving some of that residue on there was, was a great trick that's probably worked many other times before. Trust me, he's not the first one to do it. I still, you know, I, I still want my fair fight, man. I didn't get my fair fight. I want my fair shot. I feel bad. I think Japan tried to discredit, discreditate me for, for my win. On scenario number two is he's an inexperienced corner man that when he applied Vaseline on the fighter, didn't realize that he still had Vaseline on his hands. Uh, so you make your own judgment on that. There was an official hearing with the athletic commission, but ultimately GSP was not found to be a cheater. And GSP doubled down by trolling BJ Penn. I can't handle the pressure anymore. I'm falling apart. I did cheat, but not in a way that people think. If you look at the fight closely in BJ Penn entry, I hire a man kiss BJ Penn on the mouth on his way to the octagon and at that precise moment BJ Penn lost all his strength and all his focus and the fight was mine so if I cheat yes but not with the Vaseline by hiring a man to kiss him in the mouth. That would hardly be the last or the funniest time GSP trolled his way out of controversy. Now look, I'm gonna be honest with you. This video took a lot of work. We're not at the most interesting part yet and I'm not at 100K subs. So if you could subscribe and share this video with someone who'd enjoy it, I'd greatly appreciate it. Now, back to GSP. GSP's next title defense was against Tiago Alves, a terrifying knockout artist. But, spoiler alert, he dominated him at UFC 100 in his third title defense. The reason I'm breezing through this fight is because the most interesting part actually happened in the corner going into the last round. When I was on the bottom, in my guard at the third round, Thiago pushed my knee down and I heard my growing, uh, my, my abductor uh, snap. And I heard the noise like, <laughs> some people are going to see that on TV, they're going to laugh because I come back in the corner and I told my trainer, I said, I, I, I pulled the, my abductor and my trainer, Greg Jackson, he said to me, said, I don't care, I don't care, George. Hey, look at me. This is where champions are made. You understand me? Yeah. Nothing really matters sad. now. Hit him with your groin. <laughs> So I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess I have to, I have to go back and finish that fight. <laughs> That's the funniest corner advice in UFC history, but this savage mindset was necessary for a world champion like GSP, especially when things don't go well leading up to a fight. One time he got dropped in practice and um, I wanted to stop, the, I wanted to pull the plug. It was for a world title fight, he was fighting Dan Hardy. Two weeks before his fight, I, I was sure he was concussed. And I said, George, I'm pulling the, the, the round. He said to me, coach, let me finish the round, I'm okay. Let me finish the next round. And I felt that if I pulled him, I would have killed his confidence. So I said, okay, you could do the next round. And I told the other guy he was sparring with, don't land a single glove, like I whispered to him. Not a single glove on him, just take a mauling. And George went in the next round, not knowing that the other guy's not allowed to hit him at all. And he just crushes the guy, right? He just like mauls him and gets that. And I was really, really grateful for the other, the other guy was a pro. And I was very, very grateful that you know he took the beating that we asked him to. George after was like, man, I, I know I, I know it went bad in round four, but round five was amazing. I was on fire in round five. I said, you were on. <laughs> you were, you were. And still, the undisputed UFC welterweight.
champion. You've got to give props to Faraz Sahabi for not killing GSP's confidence. It definitely influenced his performance. I mean, even though he was hurt, he dominated the entire fight and went for the finish multiple times. But this is when fans started to turn on GSP. Well, I can tell you this, the fans were not happy with tonight's fight. You know, my Twitter was blowing up with a lot of negative stuff. I want to be the, the best of the best, so I have to win. And that win is not satisfying for me. I want to win and win in a, in a, in a spectacular fashion. Win. I won, but I haven't beat my performance of last time. So I'm not happy. I wanted to, to finish, you know, have a clean win. Were you impressed with what he did out there? Hey, listen, every fight you have isn't going to be the most exciting fight in the world. It was a dominant performance. He wanted to do better. I obviously wanted better. The kid sits up here and he's just so classy and he sits there and admits that he wishes he did better and, you know, people just love him. It sucks to be GSP at this point because once again, in his next two title defenses, he shut out Josh Koscheck for a second time and then he defeated Jake Shields, the former Shuto, Elite XC, and Strikeforce champion. GSP was clearly better than his opposition, but getting finishes was proving difficult. Are you satisfied with your performance? No, <laughs> no, I, I, I wanted to finish a knockout or a submission and uh, he's very tough, you know. I know I'm going to be a lot of criticized again, oh, you don't finish that fight. But you heard from some fans and people talking already, he's not going for the finish. He doesn't seem to have that killer instinct. Instinct. Would you agree with that? Nobody said anything negative about the fight whatsoever to me. I'm, I'm not fighting Tomato Can here. I'm, I'm fighting the best guy in the world. When you're at the level he's at, you're going to continue to fight the best guys in the world and, you know, uh, George St. Pierre keeps winning. And I, and I know George is going to be the, you know, the one that catches all the stuff that he didn't finish another fight, but George, George is fighting the absolute best guys in the world. So GSP was getting criticized for not finishing talented contenders and was also accused of ducking a highly anticipated super fight. There's been a lot of talk uh, at one point in time of you guys getting together and you and Anderson Silva meeting maybe at a catch weight. It's starting to almost be the time where maybe we could see that dream fight between him and GSP. George St. Pierre versus uh, Anderson Silva. George St. Pierre and Anderson Silva. Would you like that chance to take on Anderson Silva to have that sort of historical relevance? <laughs> That's a good question. Everybody asks me that. If he could cut down to 170, then I would, uh, I would look at a GSP fight. I, I would do it. Both guys would absolutely take that fight. Everybody wanted to see GSP take on the dominant middleweight champion of the world, Anderson Silva, but it wasn't GSP's fault this fight never materialized. Yeah, like like back in the day, me and Anderson Silva, is a lot of things, why it didn't happen? Is there stuff that people don't know? You have always ruled out the fight against uh, Anderson Silva, George versus Anderson at any weight. The one thing about this fight, and I keep saying this and people just don't seem to get it, it's a fantasy. This fight's a fantasy fight. Other things have to happen before this fight can even be talked about. I don't like the idea of GSP moving up. Yeah, I've never, never once talked to Anderson about fighting George St. Pierre. I've never said, hey, let's set up a fight and let's do this and that. I've never said it. I said, okay, I'll fight Anderson Silva, but in a catch weight. He go down a little bit and I go up a little bit. And also I want, I want to test for a drug. I want drug tests. And at mm. that time it was before USADA and US, UFC didn't want that. They didn't want starting drug tests. The UFC never wanted to do it. So this fight, I think I will blame the UFC. So by now, GSP is seen as a dominant champion whose fights are far too boring and predictable. But his next fight would be anything but. Tough, toughest fight in terms of damage that I get the, the most hurt. It's my fight with Carlos Condit. GSP was facing the natural born killer Carlos Condit, the former WEC welterweight champion and now interim UFC welterweight champion. You know, I, I think that I have a, uh a skill set that matches up well with George. I have something to prove to myself. And I, I want to prove to myself that I'm, I'm still the, the best guy in the world. And I, and I believe the best guy right now is Carlos. So it's up to me to come and prove it that I'm, 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 I'm better than him. It's not, not, not weaknesses in Carlos' game. So I'm going to focus on myself, of where I'm strong and what I'm going to do to him instead of thinking of what he's going to do to me. He's got a very good jiu-jitsu and he's He's not only good with his hands, standing up, knees, elbows, kicks. What makes this fight special isn't just the danger Carlos posed because after the first two rounds, GSP was winning. What makes this fight special is how GSP handled round three. I got kicked in the head. That's a oh, 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 kick to the head. He, he damaged my uh, temple artery, uh, by the way. It was a hard yeah. kick, man. George is in big trouble. So I, I'm in my butt and I see Carlos Condit coming to me and I'm like, I've seen this before. That's the hardest George St. Pierre has been hit since Matt Serra finished him many years ago. And that scenarios that happened with Matt Serra is playing in my mind. 
and I know now that if I try to stand up right away to get back in the fight because of my ego to show him that I'm not hurt, I might get knocked out. Instead of telling, oh, I need to give it back to him, I fall on the ground, I said, you know what, yes, I got caught. I lean back, I use the guard, the shield to parry the punches. It's time to defense, catch up your breath, catch up your, your senses, and I'm able to survive it. We are headed to the championship round. We got ourselves a fight. Now I know that it's the loss of Matsera and the experience that I gained from it that made me survive that kick to the head. And Matsera, by beating me, he helped me become a better martial artist. The greatest welterweight champion in UFC history. I, I give everything I had, I have no regret. I fought, I fought the, uh, the best I could. Credit to Carlos, He's, he gave me my toughest fight. I was getting hit, it was painful, but I had a, I had a lot of fun and, and I love my job and thanks to everyone for the support. GSP overcoming Carlos content is a testament to his greatness in learning from the only two losses of his career. If GSP never lost to Matt Serra, he might have cut his overall title reign short because he wouldn't have had the experience to overcome something as devastating as that kick. And above that, GSP wouldn't have gained the humility to understand his strengths and weaknesses. I don't have the knockout power of a Rampage Jackson. I don't have the athletic uh, ability of a John Jones. I don't have the accuracy of uh, Anderson Silva or the wrestling of a uh, Charles Sonnen, but I, I, I use my body with the tools I have the best as I can, and that's why I win fight. Yes, he does win fights, even if some people don't find him that impressive. And Nick, Nick Diaz says on Twitter, apparently he's not impressed uh, by my performance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Nick Diaz. You told us Diaz GSP. We're crazy for asking about this fight, a lot of hurdles, things like that. Two days later, you go on Twitter and you announce that it's actually happening in October. Well, the, the, the thing that I like about Nick Diaz is a very exciting fighter. Yes, GSP would meet the original Diaz brother for his eighth title defense, and of course, they were very friendly. Well, he's not talking like he wants to fight me. He says about me that I, I didn't want to fight him, like I, and, and I'm not a coward, you know, I never duck nobody. I'll, I'll tell you what, bro, you know, I was out there, I was fighting all the hitters, bro. You ain't fought no hitters. I don't buy this thing that, oh, he's crazy, you know. He's got are coming out trying to wrestle you out and you take these punches and you start quitting you know i say jake shields won the fight i think carlos he won the fight too that dude turns everything into a personal affair right yes he does they, they like to make me look like the bad guy george likes to say i remind him of the bullies that picked on him growing up or they had to deal with you know i'm gonna say like how many how many times you uh had a gun to your head george i think he takes it personal yes. i think he, he, he's it's man it's a freaking sport man he has the need to hate his opponent to to fight him for me there is nothing personal into a fight i don't need to hate my opponent to fight him maybe he hates my guts like i don't know what he's gonna right. i don't know if he wanted to fight me or like I, he I might no really idea. want to fight you like he's not a hype guy do you really think i'm afraid yeah, of you no that's fine okay no i don't you, of, no, you I think don't. i'm afraid of you man are you crazy in your head man i'm not scared of you you'll okay. see saturday if i'm scared of all you. right unanimous decision Lugano and still st pierre with a record-setting title defense tonight. It seemed like you guys were complimentary after the fight. I, I, I'm cool with him. I don't know if he's cool with me. It was animosity before the fight. Then after the fight, yes, it's true, we hug. And then right when I went to do a, an interview with Ariel Awani, Ariel Awani said that he just said that I hit like a girl that he want to fight me in a rematch immediately. So I... <laughs> Once again, GSP shut down an accomplished fighter in a dominant title defense. But Nick Diaz had a few excuses. He, he said for my fight that I, I, I poisoned his IV. They poisoned my IV with some kind of weird ass drug. My rap was wrong. And is there something wrong with his raps? That I was on steroids. I know that they didn't test us because they were stealing up all our piss inside little film containers. I was like, I would have tested for weed. I gotta confess, Joe. I gotta confess. Okay. I was so scared of fighting Nick Diaz, so we poisoned his IV. <laughs> but he survived. <laughs> so I was even more terrified, you know? So all the athletic commission was on my payroll, so they tricked the way and then I made it. And it went through. So I was even more terrified. So the alien abducted me and put a ga <laughs> they put the ga gamma ray to increase my strength like the Hulk like a performance enhancing oh. drug and uh, the fight was still happening so right before i put some glass and cement in my gloves to make sure and still had a crazy hard fight allegations aside gsp ran through the entire division but there was one man left who mma fans genuinely believed could beat gsp and spoiler alert they were right
keep the fans happy, knock him out. You know, that's my only goal. He's, he's uh, the number one contender for a reason. He posed a big, big threat to me. Johnny Hendricks was a power puncher tearing through the welterweight division and had only ever suffered one loss. But GSP was convinced that Johnny had an unfair advantage. Did Never. you think Hendricks was on something? It's, it's like all mind games. Oh, you're on steroids. Oh, you're on this. Fighting against performance and and seeing a drug in the sport and I felt like the UFC at the time did not add my back. You want to talk about a doping thing. Really? You know what I mean? The only thing I can say is I didn't want to attack one particular individual and I wanted to change the, the system because if you attack one individual, another one will come. Right. So in that particular case, it was Hendrix. I wanted to do it not to hurt the UFC. That was not my goal. I wanted to elevate the UFC, elevate the sport. Because it's, it's, it's the outcome of a, of, of, a, of a win or lose are very dramatic in our sport. It could, could influence the, the life of, of an individual. It could be very bad. He agreed. It was public. He agreed. When we, we say it, you can look, you have the evidence that in the interview, he said I, he agreed to do a test. But then he said, oh, no, I did not agree because also the UFC told him to not agree. The UFC told him. He picked the wrong guy to do a drug test. Why didn't he do a drug test six years ago? Huh? Six fights. Six, the last six fights for the last six years, he hadn't why, done one. Why won't you do it now? Yeah. Why won't I do it? Because he's yeah. on Vada. Vada, his, his, his face is all over the front page. But you do, you do and, it for everybody. Huh? I don't wish people bad luck, but if you cheat, you cheat, man. And they, a lot of people got cut. UFC athletic or the Athletic State Commission of Nevada said don't do what bought it. So you don't want to say whether or not you suspect that Johnny Hendricks is doing something, but there was people that were definitely doing something. Yes. I, I, I don't have the evidence. Maybe right. he did, maybe he didn't. That's a good way to look at it. I don't, I don't want to accuse. I don't care if he passes. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't care if he took the drug test. I want him to be the best GSP he can be. And if that's on something, that's on something. I, and even though he's posing a lot of threat, I, I'm confident I'm going to win the fight. But unfortunately, that was false confidence. Before I fought Johnny Hendricks, I, I was going through... I was, I was afraid to talk about it because I was... I was, I thought that people will not respect me and will laugh at me. The first round he came out, he tried to establish a jab, which wasn't working. He was trying to throw a couple of kicks. I checked everything. I felt like I was like, kind of a feeling of a claustro claustrophobic feeling, you know, like I was, right. I couldn't breathe well, I couldn't sleep well, I, my mind. Too much I, pressure? I, I, too much pressure, personal problems, so much stuff. He did get the takedown, but at the end of the first round, I ended up getting a takedown, and I thought I controlled the fight from there on. The first round, he was already cut. I was going through a depression, and people would be like, oh, he's, what he has to complain of, he's, uh, he's, he's rich, he's popular, he's the champion, and some people are poor, like, what he has nothing to complain, but, but I felt like I had too much on my shoulder. Besides the first round and the fifth round, those are the only two times he got a takedown. The third round, he was bloody and blue. I did feel well, and I, I was trying to perform under the, those conditions, and it was catching up to me. Fourth round, I took him down and grounded pounded, I don't know, what, a minute, something like that. Do I look like I got in a fight? Not really, right? I've pretty much controlled everything that GSP, they thought GSP was going to control on me, I did to him. What a fight. I think we may have a new welterweight champion. I just beat the pound for pound best fighter in the world. You know what I mean? Like just, uh, I just, I, look at him. Look at him and look at me. He did it. Hendricks beat George St. Pierre. All he needed was for the judges to make it official. And still the undisputed. I'm blown away that George St. Pierre won that fight. I absolutely won this fight and some people took it away from me. And listen, I'm a promoter. He's the biggest pay-per-view star on, on the planet for me. And I still don't think he won that fight. Listen, everyone, it was a lot of talk uh, about what's going to happen. I have, a, I have a bunch of stuff in my life happening. I need to, to hang up my glove for a little bit, at least make a point on my life. Are you retiring right now? Is that what you're saying? I have, I have to go away for a little bit. You, you, don't, you don't just say, hey, I'm gonna take a, a while off. Maybe I'll be back, maybe I won't. Just need a, need a, need to think and uh, you know what I mean? See what's, what's gonna happen, you know? You owe it to the fans, you owe it to that belt, you owe it to this company, and you owe it to Johnny Hendricks 
to give him that opportunity to, to, to fight again. I, I, stuff going on in my life. It's my personal life. I cannot speak to you about, about this. You're a reporter. I know your job is to make a thing in public, but I have a personal life. I, I keep personal some of, some, of my, some of my stuff. I do want to be fair in saying that I do believe Hendrix should have gotten his hand raised that night. However, it is also worth noting that Hendrix had a catastrophic decline in his fighting ability with the introduction of USADA in the UFC. He was practically unrecognizable as a fighter, which, to GSP's point, may support that he had an unfair advantage. But beyond that, we have to remember that great fighters like Khabib and John Jones also collected controversial victories, with John Jones beating Dominic Reyes and Khabib having a very similar situation with Glace and Tebow. But that's neither here nor there, because after Hendrix, GSP relinquished his title, concluding his time as the welterweight champion for good. Why did you take four years off, by the way? Why did you? Oh, I, I think I, went, I was in depression a little bit. Carrying all that 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 weight of being champion, defending the belt, the criticizes and everything, it, it took a toll on me. GSP disappeared from the octagon for four years before he started to get the itch to come back. You, you took four years off. Yeah. How many years in were you like, like, I think I'm ready to come back. When I see USA, USADA and the, the drug testing program being implanted, I didn't want to come back when the sport was dirty. That's one of my things. So, so what made you want to come back uh, and fight again? I never took a retire. I, I just needed time off to get out of, uh, get out of the of the spotlight. So GSP knew he wanted to come back. He just needed to come back for something different. Essentially, he walked away from the game. And he walked away for four years. That's a long time to be out of a, a sport. So my question to him was, if you're going to come back, are you just going to do the same thing? You're just going to come back to welterweight and do what you always did? Well, I wanted to come back for something that excited me, something that was different, something that was r unique and rare, you know, and, and, and I didn't want to come back to do the same thing I was doing before. Let's do something significant, something you haven't done before. So John, John he told me, he said, listen, said, you always have three big criticizing, criticizes when you were fighting. Number one, you never fought up a weight class. You never went up. Number two, you fought so tactically sound that matches could become dull. People say that you're kind of boring, you're too much cere cerebral, technical, you, you don't want to take unnecessary risks, r which make the fight boring. The average fan was like, well, yeah, he's, he's winning easily, it's dominant, but doesn't do it for me. It's not exciting, there's no drama in the fights. I was blame to be kind of boring because I was not taking enough risk but why would I take a risk if I'm winning the fight right why would I take a stupid risk and and let an opportunity to my opponent to give me a fatal blow to knock me out it's up to him to take the risk in the third most persistent criticism he didn't finish fights okay he was a, he was a very skilled fighter he wasn't finishing fights you know that was one of my big criticizing criticizes so my point to him is okay if you're going to come back let's do it in a way where you address those three things that's why when i came back after four years i didn't want to come back and do the same thing again i wanted to take on a, a title in a new weight class every weight class no one gives story. a fuck. no one gives a fuck. Josh, everybody, I'm sorry I'm late. I have an, an opportunity to fight for the, the title. What exactly are you going to do? You're going to jab, jab, double leg, bore everybody to sleep. In a higher weight class, make history. I on the other side is going to try and knock you out. Against Michael Bisping, who got the most win in UFC history. I'll take being a six foot two Englishman over a five foot nine steaming pile of French piss. I hate him when I was in training camp, but I loved him as well at the same same time. Does he pose any sort of unique challenges to you? It doesn't pose any unique challenges. All he does is hold on for dear life like a little p I'm gonna punch him, I'm gonna slam him, I'm gonna submit him. I'll be using footwork, I'll be picking him off. I'm taller, I'm longer, I'm faster. I have a better arsenal of strikes. I can read him, I've got more heart, I've got more brains. I was expecting some more you douchebags to have the f headbands on from Karate Kid today. <laughs> Where are you all? Where are the GSB fans? Come on, George, what the f is going on? This is your place. I can see a vein in his forehead now. Relax, George, deep breath, come on, yoga. When we did that, that press conference, we, we had a stare down and, and we kind of, he kind of, he kind of went to touch me, so I had to push him. After the conference, we go by the back, kind of the back door of a mall. So there's a camera, like I think it was TMZ or something. It was a camera that follow us. So there is kids following us. To, they're about to ask us, they ask me to take pictures. And then, and then I see a camera coming towards me and then I see Michael. I think he saw that TMZ was there. So he walked back to me. And Michael says to me, he's like, 
don't you f put your hand on me again because na 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 na. Then I look in his face and like, it's like what? Hey, f off, man. I'm telling you, f off. off. You're the one that put your hand on me. Keep your hands to yourself. Yeah, f off. It cre create kind of a buzz for the fight, and and we start to to shout at each other. And I'm not afraid of you. I'm, you give a damn. you be I'm not afraid of you. Then the kids they, they, who came to ask me for an autograph. They can, they can, they kind of get um, intimidating. They were like, <laughs> they went back. I'm like, then I turn around. I say, it's okay, it's finished. Now you can come and go. Aah. That was probably the best promotion of the whole fight. Like that particular incident. I'm gonna look to knock him out, and George is gonna be standing there like a rabbit in the headlights. Are you probably drunk? Like the last press conference. No, no, I would have fucked you up then, and I'll fuck you up now, little guy. <laughs> and he's gonna be frozen like this, like a lizard that doesn't want to move. Okay, and I will pounce, pow, and take him out, and I'll splat you. I'll splat you like the little nerd that he is. Are you intoxicated or something? Is that all you got? Is that that's why you wear some sunglasses? Is that the only line you've got? Are you intoxicated? Yeah. <laughs> Makes fighting. That's what I do best. I'm in the best shape of my life in my prime. Are you intoxicated? <laughs> Are you intoxicated? I go to the bathroom in between. Who comes next to the bathroom with with us? My cold piss, but we're, I'm, we're taking a piss ne next to each other. We're like this. Then he look at me, look at me. Then he start laughing. Then I, then I start laughing. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I know. It's like, okay, game face. See you later. <laughs> But I tell you what hasn't changed. He's got the same fucking suit as the last press conference. Come on, George, you got some money, man. Buy a new suit. What the fuck? You look like a history teacher. Johnny Hendricks hit him in the head so many times. He thought he'd been abducted by aliens. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. The saying is not, if at first I don't succeed, I'm gonna fucking run off and cry like a little bitch. Why Michael Bisping as opposed to a warm up fight considering the four year hiatus? Why would you do that against this dude who's big? You've never fought as a middleweight before. George is a has-been. He's a has-been. He's, he's a great fighter from yesteryear. It's never been done before after four years. And if I do it, that's mean I will be the first to do it. So that's why I'm doing it. He's gonna he's gonna lose November 4th. This I can guarantee you. He's not he's not gonna beat me. This there's nothing more sure. Water is wet, fire burn, and I'm gonna beat Michael Bisping. Old statements by both men, but whose words? would ring true. When he came back, this is what was really interesting about that fight. George had said, I'm better. I'm a better martial artist than I was before. And he looked better. And I was thinking when you came back, I was like, if you were saying that you were better than ever, I'm like, man, he might be better than ever. You, you didn't look like you were gone. Like, you, like right away, you, it felt like you felt right back into the groove again. You didn't look out of place. You didn't look uncomfortable. You were showing things, especially different things with your kicking and your movement that we hadn't seen from you before. Like, it looked like you had improved. When you're fighting a taller guy, he's punching down on you because the Michael is taller than me. Because he's punching down on you, he's wide open. Right. However, if you're like me, smaller than him, and you're punching up, you're protected. So if I start to double you, it will crutch me down, it will force him to punch me down in the exchange and then come back to the top. And that's why I did with the hook. That's how I dropped him. GMP drops big pick! Oh, big elbows from St. Pierre! And I know that Michael is very good at standing back up from, from his back. But the way he does it, he likes to go on four, four point on his limb because he's very strong like this. However, there's a catch to it. <laughs> he exposes his back. Mm. So I give him an opening. My dream come true, guys. Thank you for the support. Chokes him unconscious with yeah. a rear naked choke that was one of the tightest, most cinched up rear naked chokes I've ever seen anybody perform, ever. George looked awesome tonight. I see a lot of people saying, you know, after taking that much time off, moving up a division and beating you, he deserves to be called the greatest of all time. Do you, do you believe that? Well, I'd say so. Yeah, good for him. George St. Pierre became the fourth fighter in UFC history to win belts in two different weight classes. An astonishing feat, but his body wouldn't allow him to defend the belt. The reason why I relinquished the belt is I, I want to do some physical tests to see what, what, what is the problem with my health condition because during the, 
the camp. I knew I had problem, but I didn't know what it was. I knew it was, you know, the, the test, the blood test and everything for the cancer, it came negative. So after I went to do like, like I said, colonoscopy, it came back that I had a, a, a ulcer inside my stomach. Then as a doctor, I say, how long it takes to get rid of this? I say, it's all your life. Uh, I can tell you what the symptoms were. It was extreme stomach pain and inability to eat. It screwed up his entire diet. When I'm looking at the landscape, I see a lot of guys, like for example, Conor McGregor, he hold on to the title. To, to, for the attention, the sponsors, the this and that. They kind of stole the division. And I said to myself, I said, you know, I, I stand for for the fighters. I always did, you know. I relinquished it right away. You know, I don't want to stall the division and make people wait right. because of me. You know, the, the world don't go around me. Everybody knows it's not a surprise. I, I announced my retirement. There's no tears. I'm very happy to do it in full contact sport. That's how you should retire. You should retire on top and uh, that is very hard to do. George St. Pierre retired with a tremendous legacy that few men could even come close to, including men he almost fought. This guy was my father's favorite fighter. I grew up watching his fights. We, we were trying to have that, that fight with uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I wanted to come back for Khabib um, because it was, so, you know, for a fighter, the scariest thing sometimes is the most exciting thing to do. And it's a problem that never been solved before. UFC categorically refused the idea of me fighting Khabib because they, they had other plan for Khabib. When Khabib fought Justin Gaethje and beat Justin Gaethje, I think he took everybody by surprise by, uh, he took, he announced his retirement. I, I knew some know. people in his camp told me that he was going to call me out and he retire. And you know what? It's maybe better like that for, for both of us. So we have a good ending. You can compare GSP to Khabib, John Jones, Demetrius Johnson, or anyone else you like. But for many, the legacy of George St. Pierre speaks for itself. I've always believed the three greatest mixed martial artists I've ever seen in my life were George St. Pierre, Khabib Nurmagomedov, and John Jones. The three of them have some interesting similarities and differences. All three beat every single person they ever faced. George does have two losses. There were Matt Hughes and Matt Serra, right? And came back and destroyed them in the mm -hmm. rematches. All three athletes have at least one match, which is controversial in terms of who won and who lost. John Jones has had several matches which could have gone either way. Khabib's match against Gleason Tebow could have gone either way. George's match with Hendrix was, could have gone either way. George Shapiro is the greatest mixed martial artist of all time. And for all the other candidates that are up there have either lost or have had prob problems passing you side of tests. You know, George St. Pierre, is, he's a special guy. Which answer you give as to which of those three is the greatest of all time will come down to the criteria that you use. Is it being undefeated? Is it the amount of time? Or is it the quality of the opponents that they had? He fought the hardest fights. I mean, he fought... He fought and dominated the golden age of the welterweight division. It was the golden age. If you do it by quality of opponents, I think you probably have to give it to George. You look, George St. Pierre, you know, he took four years off and everything like that, but he's still one of the greatest, if not the greatest of all time. He is the greatest of all time, without a doubt, in my opinion. Ultimately, you've got those three guys, in my opinion, and which one you choose will come down to who, it says more about who you are as a viewer than it does about the respective label of the athletes. And John Danaher is absolutely correct. We may never agree on the criteria for the greatest of all time, but if you made it this far, you probably resonate a lot more with GSP's journey than any GOAT candidate. When you have a dream and you believe in it, you have to to work for it. And I think yeah, there is nothing impossible in life. And I, I've been a, an underdog all, all my life, but uh, you know, I work hard to be where I'm at. If people didn't know you, all right, if the, the average person did not know what you do, besides the, the look, you know, that you're physically strong, they would never think that you're a fighter. You're a very friendly guy. I don't want to look like a fighter when you talk to me, let's say on the phone, I want to, I want to look like a no normal human being. I never liked to fight. I never liked it. People like, oh, you're bullshit. No, man, I never liked it. For me, it's unbearable. It, it is very hard. <laughs> no, I don't like to fight. And everybody in the room turn around, they look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, you guys are all crazy. You think I like to fight in a cage in front of a million of people, maybe get humiliated, knocked out, or die? Are you crazy? I don't like to fight. Are you nuts? Fighting is uh, my life. That's what I, I love to do in my life. And I, I hope I'm gonna do it for a long time. Yeah. People say, oh, fighting is my... No, man, fighting is not my life, man. My life is my family, man, is, is my friend, the people I love. This is what I do in my life, is not my life, man. It's more 
to, to life than fighting. Fighting is unbearable. I do it because what it gives me, what it provides me. I love the freedom, the freedom that it brings me. I love the fact that it keeps me in shape. I love the confidence that this sport gives me. I love to go to the gym, to train with my training partner, the, the camaraderie that I have. I love the science of the game, the, the art of war, the, 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 the chess game of fighting. I love that, that I have access of things that most people don't, do not have access. I love that. But in order to preserve that, I needed to go take that walk and fight in the octagon. And, but I hated it. I despised it. I never liked it. I never enjoyed it a second. I like to win. When you win, you're, it's, the feeling is unbelievable. It's so good that it's worth this. Yeah, I, I pretend that yeah, I'm happy like, and everything. Yeah, I mean, it's good. <laughs> yeah, but deep down, deep down inside, I'm like, shoot, what the hell I'm doing here? It's funny hearing that from you because you would you would expect to hear that from someone who isn't considered one of the greatest of all time but you're considered one of the greatest of all time so it would be very art it would be very hard to argue your approach because it's been so successful what i did and before every fight i i didn't not cut corner i did everything i needed to do I, and i trained hard and i most importantly i trained smart i i, I did the best i could do i i leave no stone unturned so I, I gave myself the right to be confident. I was afraid, I was terrified, but I was confident. Have you ever slept well before a fight? Never. Never. Only one time. Which fight? When I fought Matt, Matt Serra. <laughs> and I got knocked out. <laughs> You've had many great moments in the UFC and the sport. Is there one that stands out, your favorite moment of all time? My, my favorite moment of all time was um, when I was able to uh, win, avenge my loss against Matt Serra. Every time I've lost, I've learned why I lost, and I made sure that I never made the same mistake twice. Before I started doing MMA, I wanted to be a MMA professional fighter. Everybody told me I couldn't do it, and I did. People used to tell me all my life, oh, you will never be a, a fighter, you know, you, you're not tough enough, you're not strong enough. After I became an MMA professional fighter, I wanted to fight in UFC, the most prestigious organization. Everybody told me I couldn't do it, and I did it. After that, I wanted to become UFC world champion. Everybody told me, ah, oh, it's impossible, uh, Matt Hughes, this guy gonna be there forever, he's, he's a beast. And I, and I did it, I beat him. And I beat him, not, not that I beat him easy, but I beat him more decisively because I, I had confidence. You can have all the skills that you want, but if you don't have confidence, it's like someone who has a lot of money in his bank account, but no way of accessing it. After I became champion, I wanted to make sure I had uh, security, like enough money to take care of me and my family. I wanted to pay my... my 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 other goal was to pay my parent house and after a john fitch fight i did i pay, i pay my parent rent i went to the bank it was the most beautiful day of my life i reached my goal now my my goal is to be known as the best uh, mma fighter in the in the history i wanted to become the best fighter that was my dream and i want to be known as the, the guy who made the difference not only in the in the octagon also as a spokesperson a lot of the kids look up to us and I think it's important for me as a champion to, to give the good example. Well, you've already done that just by being who you are, you know, by your, your personality, you know, your, your ability to just be a normal guy who just how happens to be one of the baddest motherfuckers on the planet. I also helped change for the performance enhancement, enhancing testing. And, and I'm glad I did it. You know, I did it to elevate the game. And also I wanted to retire on top. I didn't want the sport to retire me. It's when I, I retire, I want to be known as the, the best uh, fighter in the history of the sport of MMA, pound for pound of all time. That's how I want to be known. Like everything, everything, every good thing has an end. It's a good story that starts from the bottom and go up, and it's a very nice ending. Thanks for the, to the fans, because if I have what I have to do, it's because of the fans and the UFC. Being the strongest man in the world, that's my, that was my dream when I was young. That's why I did UFC. I wanted to be the stronger man in the world. Everything I've done in my life was to get me closer to my ultimate goal. Most people consider you to be the number one greatest mixed martial arts fighter ever. A lot of people, including myself, consider you the greatest of all time, the greatest MMA <coughs> fighter of all time. Do you agree? Is being referred to as the GOAT something you care about? I just wanna let know my fans. I wanna keep, I wanna stay in the UFC. I wanna be a UFC guy. And soon I will be world champion. Thank you very much. If people think my goal was to be champion, it's, it's, it's BS, it's not my goal. The greatest of all time, it depends. 
it, it varies. It's a very subjective thing. And I realize over the years, it did not exist. You cannot be the stronger man in the world. This is an illusion. Greatest of all time, it, it's something that does not exist. Baddest man on the planet, it's an illusion. I use that as a platform to get me to my goal. In mixed martial art, I achieve what I needed to achieve. I'm satisfied. I'm no longer the same Georges St. Pierre than when I was on, begging for a title shot on my knees. My goal is to have a family and live long and happy wow. with my loved one. That's my goal. I think that's the ultimate goal is greatness, is to be happy. If you're happy, oh, you're yes. successful. Thank you to my members. If you like this video, I have plenty more and subscribe because no one knows who the f he is, and he's gonna be that guy when I'm world champion, when I'm a legend. He's gonna be at some pub talking some shit about I beat that guy one time.